Do you need to find a skeleton? How would you tell people that design? You personally, how would you tell that design? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on this. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here once again to take a gander at the fine folks at Genesis Apologetics. Basically, I was inspired by R&R series on their K-8 programming to take a look at what else is on there. Unfortunately, I can't speak Hindi. Yet. So I can't look at their content in that language. But also unfortunately, I can speak English, so I ended up suffering through their English language content. So, Dan Biddle, Homo Ipse, is here to tell us how man, meaning mankind broadly, is created in God's image and didn't evolve. One thing he does a lot of that I'm not going to bother individually addressing is he likes to point out cool factoids, like how long your DNA would be if you unwound it. Yeah, those things are cool, but they aren't arguments for or against evolution, abiogenesis, God, or anything else. An impressive fact by itself doesn't argue for any particular theory. So unless he goes from pointing out an impressive thing to actually making an argument, I'm just not going to talk about it. Well enough preamble. Dan? And they, and they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Do you know this is still going on today? That's their four-footed beast today. The corruptible thing that's not in the image of God that people like to worship. I have literally never met anyone who claimed to worship Morganukadon. I've never seen a church of Morganukodon. I've never roasted chestnuts on Morganukodonmas. Secularists worship this in a way because this is Schrodinger. This is what they think humans evolved from. This little rat. That is in no way a rat. It's not even properly a mammal, although it is close. This was an egg-laying mammaliform that was primarily an insectivore, although I'm pretty sure if presented with the opportunity it would eat a small frog or whatever. At this point in the evolution of mammals, we don't actually even have crown mammals yet. And to get to rodents, you'd have to go in order through true mammals, therians, eutherians, boreo-eutherians, archontoglears, glears, rodents, and specifically, muridae. That's eight named clades, and those aren't even all the clades that need to evolve before we can call anything a rat. And by the way, humans split off from rats at archontoglears, so from then on, humans and rats have separate ancestry. So humans did evolve from something like Morganukodon, but definitely not rats. They say it crawled in a hole when the dinosaurs were getting extinct, it crawled in a little three-foot hole and hid out when the asteroids were bombarding Earth, and that led to the mammal line that led to primates that led to humans. Morganukodon went extinct long before the asteroid impact, but then again, Dan Biddle is extremely confused about what science says about that impact. See my series above for a discussion about that. Morganukodon is known from the late Triassic through the early Jurassic. And the only thing that Dan got right there is that it probably is at least morphologically similar to the ancestor of Crown Amelia, and also probably did live in a burrow. That's where they think we evolved from. But don't you see an interesting correlation here? They changed the glory of the in uncorruptible, eternal God into an image made like corruptible man and into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. <laughs> and then we have this. But it gets even worse. Here's the Natural History Muse Museum in Washington, D.C. It's got a little throne room. Uh, no. <laughs> As a rule, throne rooms need a throne. Also, they usually need to be actually, you know, a room. Just saying. And on the outside of the throne room, it says... Come meet one of your oldest relatives. It's like a shrine. They have these big pillars here, and they've got the mammal orders going up here. And then you walk in, and you think, well, my gosh, what do they have here on a little altar? Dude, come on. Not anything that's a raised platform is an altar. Altars are sacrificial tables. I promise you, no one is going up to that display to sacrifice anything. You can describe anything you want using religious terms that don't actually fit, but that says more about you than it does the people who designed this museum display. Also, notice how even according to Biddle, the display says relative and not ancestor. That's good because Morganukodon probably isn't directly ancestral to modern mammals. In the middle of this little shrine throne room. Well, that's what they have. A little golden rat that they say we evolved from. One, not a rat. Two, almost certainly bronze, not gold. This is a museum, not Fort Knox. They can't afford a gold statue. Three, 
Biddle already said they are calling it a relative, not an ancestor. It represents the kind of anatomy the common ancestor of mammals probably had. Isn't that uncanny? The saddest thing I've ever seen in my life that brought me to tears that's creation related is in the same museum, you can go over to a little spot where they have a whole bunch of computers and, and this place was crowded. There was like 40 people there trying to do this. You, they had like six different stations. You walk up and you choose your human evolution icon. It could be Lucy or Homo erectus or Neanderthal, whatever. And it would take a picture of you and it would superimpose a picture of Lucy onto your face kind of merge the two. And then I realized, okay, I see what you're doing, Satan. You have an insatiable desire to corrupt the image of God. Amen. Who's the image bearer? Right. We are. We're made in the image of God. And so you go to the Natural History Museum, and they're like, hey, take a, a picture of your face. We'll take some ape icon, the image of an ape, and smush it over your image of God. And I'm sitting there watching people line up to do this, and they have no idea how they're participating in the mockery of God. It was sad. It, you can't get mad, you just, you just have to be sad about it. It's amazing to me what creationism will do. This is what breaks Dan's heart. Not, you know, starving children, the firebombing of churches in the Middle East, not ethnic cleansing in Ashdown Forest. Nope. It's a goofy museum display where you can see yourself looking like various hominins. Also, I love that he has, as in all things, decided to take the absolute dumbest take on the Imago Dei. Sure, you could go with the image of God being about moral and intellectual capacity and creative drive, you know, like most theologians. But nope, Dan has enclosed eye sockets, fingernails, and tricuspid molars as the image of God. I probably don't have to tell you why it is that basically anyone who thinks about it for more than a few seconds concludes that if there is a transcendent God who created the universe, that God probably isn't an ape from Earth. Also, Dan believing that what Satan, the Prince of Lies, is up to is making cutesy museum displays that don't actually contradict belief in God is just ugh, perfect. I'm predicting that the next hot trend in supernatural horror is museum exorcisms. But in the middle of this little shrine room, on the altar, they have this little creature here, and they say, uh, but a close relative of this tiny creature was the first mammal on Earth. Its DNA was passed on to billions of descendants, including you which is explicitly not a claim that humans descended from Morganucodon. After this, we get a bit about the Bible. I'm cutting it out. This channel is for science, not for Bible study. So there's lots of people running around today. You can look at different uh, groups like BioLogos, and they're promoting widely the idea to Christians all over the world that we evolved from either a mythical Adam or ape-like creature. So you've got our Savior dying for the sins of a mythical person, or someone who evolved from apes that was already killing and doing survival by, by the fittest kind of stuff. Very, very interesting. Yes, it is interesting that, just like with the shape of the Earth and the heliocentric solar system, Christians have had to adapt to the findings of science and conform their view of the Bible and their religion to scientific ideas that were not around when the various books of the Bible were written. I'm not here to tell Dan if that's a good thing or a bad thing according to the Bible or God or whatever. But Christianity and Judaism have both adapted to new scientific ideas before, they're doing it now with evolution, and they'll probably keep doing it. Then Dan has a bit on soteriology that I don't care about, so again, I cut it out. All right, so let's review some of the evidence uh, for, 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 for humans being created first. I went over this already in one of my previous talks, and we're also going to cover Lucy again tonight, and that's about a five-minute clip, and it's all going to be repeat. Because Dan likes to pretend that that one specimen is basically all there is to know about hominins. But it's important to, re to cover some of this stuff twice. In fact, there was a student of Dave's who was on a field trip who was in San Francisco at the Natural History Museum, and she was there with her class, and people were, were just gazing up at the Lucy icon that they have here. And this, this gal, a Christian, said, well, that, we didn't evolve from Lucy. And she talked about the wrists that were st stiff that she could walk on and the sloped face. She had all the facts there, and she shared it with her public school class. That poor person. If the facts she had are the ones Biddle has, then most of them are wrong. And the few that aren't are what evolution would predict anyway. Very interesting. So this stuff is technical, so we will be covering two topics tonight that we've already covered previously. 
And this is one. We talked about the idea of the interdependent nature of a key and a lock. A key does nothing. It's worthless without the lock socket. And same thing with the lock socket. doesn't do anything without a key. It's an interdependent system that's just like your car. Your car has these five different components. You've got your flywheel here, which is going to start your engine. You've got a starter and an alternator and these cables that connect it to your battery. Not only do you need all five components, they have to be connected in the order that they're shown here. You start changing things around, you're going to blow up your battery or you're not going to be able to start your car. It's an interdependent system that obviously demands a designer. These things will never form, them, form themselves uh, randomly. Yep, it sure is true that mechanical and non-reproducing things tend to evolve and need to be designed. Too bad that organisms do evolve and we can watch it happen in real time with no design, so... I'm not sure how this analogy is helpful. Oh wait, it's deliberately unhelpful, right? The human ear trumps the lock and key and it trumps the starting system by a factor of about a million because we have five separate systems here. So you've got your outside ear, a pin on, which is designed for trapping air molecules that I'm pushing around the room here. And which is unique to mammal line organisms. Weird how you don't actually need that bit in order to hear unless Dan is going to claim that lizards and birds are deaf, which would be a weird claim, especially given the existence of songbirds. Would they be singing to if they're deaf because they lack pinnae? Goes down three inches to your tamponic membrane, wiggles these three little tiny bones that upsample the pressure by another factor of 22. Those little bones. Fun fact about those bones. They're jaw bones. And I don't mean that they look like tiny jaws. I mean that in embryonic development, they start in the mammal jaw and are the same bones that develop in reptiles into the posterior jaw bones. But in mammals, they migrate from the back of the mouth to the ear. And interestingly, in many reptiles, these bone jaws pick up vibrations to supplement the hearing they get from their tympanic membranes. Even wilder is that we actually have fossils of this migration over geologic time, so we have the evolutionary transition in fossils and the ontological transformation in embryos. The evolution of the mammal ear is in fact one of the best documented transitions in all of nature, and it goes all the way back to the Triassic critters, like Probanagnathus. Probanagnathus had both the typical reptile jaw joint and the mammal jaw joint, a condition that was predicted to have existed in a mammal ancestor by evolutionary theory. When it gets into your cochlea, which is filled with fluid, that convert this leverage system to a hydraulic system, to a chemical system, then to an electrical system. And that strikes Dan as a design? That sounds positively Rube Goldbergian, and absurdly complex. Look, microphones that we humans have designed for basically the same purpose as ears just go right from a mechanical system to an electrical system. They don't have to have a stop off at hydraulics and chemistry for no reason. If the ear is designed by an intelligence even greater than anything attainable by humans, surely it wouldn't be so haphazard with so many failure points. And all five of these had to be designed by a designer because you've got sound wave, trapping device and you've got a mechanical system with these little bones that, that create leverage by a factor of 1.7 converted to a hydraulic machine that upsamples it again by 22 times then into a chemical system and then into another chemical system in your brain. So that to me is quite obvious that humans were breathed into existence with those components put in the right order at the right time. You can't evolve a system like this. It all has to be present. No, it actually doesn't, because we know of living animals without many of those things, and they manage to hear. Of the lizards who can hear, they have a very simple ear with a tympanic membrane or eardrum, only one bone in the middle ear, and then a cochlea, with no pinnae, no extra bones. Some don't even have a tympanic membrane, and while this does restrict the range of frequencies that they can hear, they still manage to sense vibrations. Oh, and then there are those most specialized of lizards, the snakes. They basically only sense vibration through their jaw. You know, using those bones that in mammals still sense vibration, but have migrated to the actual ear. And people understand, you know that intuitively. This is Romans 1 talking to you that although they said that they didn't know God, God made it clear because he revealed himself and what he created. That's quite obvious. The thing is, though, it's only obvious if you assume design from the outset. If you don't, then it becomes clear that this whole contraption is kind of crazy. That's actually the case for a lot of stuff in life. It's absurdly complex. And then people who are already predisposed to seeing supernatural designs see that. And people who are not see a tangled mess of nonsense that no one would design. Okay, the next one is DNA design. So we'll look at a couple of short videos about uh, DNA here. Let's start by looking at DNA, a protein coding language that cannot be replicated by any scientist in the world. 
It's the most sophisticated information storage system in the known universe. Nothing comes even close. At this point, humans have managed to store, for at least a while, a few qubits on a single atom. That's way better data storage than DNA, like by orders of magnitude. Granted, we're pretty far from a reliable quantum computer, but still, you can't say that humans can't do better than DNA for data storage. They absolutely can. In fact, over 10,000 DNA molecules can fit on the head of a pin, and unfolding just one of them reveals six feet of instructions capable of building who you are. Stretching out DNA in the trillions of cells in your body could reach to the sun and back hundreds of times. This whole argument is just, gee whiz, DNA is cool, therefore it must not be natural. Because apparently anything in nature that's impressive is prima facie evidence for intelligent design. That's amazing. Again, it screams design. I mean, you can take thousands of DNA molecules, put it on the head of a pen, just take one of them and stretch it out and it's got six feet of information on it. First, information isn't typically measured in feet, so that's weird. Second, is the argument that stretchiness means God? Like, what are we really talking about there? Very, very amazing. And here is what an animation, this just came out a little while ago, showing what's happening in your body right now when your DNA is being replicated. It's a 20 second clip. This is a very, very realistic animation of what's going on in your body right now as your DNA is replicating. So we've got billions of these molecular machine, machines that are copying your DNA. If that's not a machine, I don't know what is. I mean, do you think people could build that? That's impossible. It's happening at the molecular level. Humans can't build tornadoes. Does that mean that every tornado is directly created by God? The current inability of humans to do a thing, or even their inability to ever do a thing, doesn't for that reason indicate that when you find it, it must have been God. The capacity of nature to make things is not limited by human capacities. And that, that part, the, the last clip right there was in real time. Here's another one we'll look at. Um, this is gene transcription. And they're gonna slow it down and then they're gonna put it in real time. This is happening uh, with, it's a transcription of genetic code from DNA into RNA. This is just one stage that happens in your body. So they're gonna show how complex it is here in a minute, then they're gonna speed it up to real time. So that's what it looks like when you slow it down, DNA going into the RNA there. This is all happening in your body. Yep, carbon chemistry is pretty cool, and chemical changes can happen pretty damn fast. And then look what happens when they go into real time. Again, it's literally just a neat thing. Therefore, God had to make it miraculously. So God is God of the big sauropod dinosaurs and he's God at the molecular level also. Why are we talking about sauropods all of a sudden? But yeah, obviously, if there's a singular transcendent omnipotent creator God, that God would be the God of everything. That doesn't help us answer the question of whether humans evolved, which I'll remind you is the topic. But also DNA replication and transcription goes back way farther than humans and apes. So would Dan be okay with saying that universal common ancestry is true as long as abiogenesis was a direct miracle from God? Because that's what this argument would lead you to. If God designed DNA and then we hang our hat on that, then that basically leaves every single branch in the tree of life right where science says it is, and you do not end up with the creationist orchard. In order to reject human common ancestry with apes, we need to look at things unique to apes, not common in all of life. Okay, so what about DNA? Does it reveal any evidence for creation? Well, in fact, it does if you look at mitochondrial uh, DNA. How hard can I possibly press that X button to doubt? This one's a little bit more complex to, to get through, but let's watch a short video about this. Evolutionary researchers have based these timelines on the assumption that humans and chimps shared a common ancestor about 5 million years ago. That's a conclusion based on things like the measured genetic replacement rate in both species. Only after concluding that that time frame is as accurate as we can, both with our current tools, do we then go on to assume it. That's an important part of science. Assumptions beyond the basics of the invariance of the laws of nature are actually well-supported conclusions from other bits of science. For example, when a doctor prescribes you antibiotics for your sore throat from which a certain bacterial colony was grown, he is assuming that the germ theory of disease is true and that antibiotics will kill the harmful bacteria. Both of these things are the conclusion of centuries of previous medical science building upon itself to get better and better. Similarly, in population genetics, trends are measured, hypotheses are tested, 
and after the testing and measuring, the conclusions can then go on to be assumed in later works. That date was based on counting the mtDNA and protein differences between all the great apes and timing their divergence using dates from fossils of one great ape's ancestor. So evolutionists have theorized, in part based upon the, the, the mutations of our mitochondrial DNA, which is the DNA that's passed through the maternal line, that they say, well, we think it would take lots and lots of mutations to go from chimps all the way to humans, and we think it was about a five million years ago process. I really, really, really hate the way he tried to explain that chart. You don't go from chimp to human. Humans didn't evolve from chimps. Humans and chimps share a common ancestor. That's why on the chart, the label for genus Pan, that is the genus of chimpanzees, doesn't come until well above the split from this common ancestor. Also, I love how creationists will shout from the rooftops that their misunderstanding of mitochondrial Eve is support for a literal historicity of Genesis, but when the same techniques are used on humans and other apes, with the same kinds of results, suddenly, oh no, this is full of evolutionary assumptions and can't be trusted. At this point, creationists must have picked enough cherries to feed an army on nothing but cherry pie. And then we're learning things like this. Um, they, they've compared now observed mitochondrial DNA. They took a couple thousand people, put them in a study, and looked at how quickly our mitochondrial DNA is actually mutating, how frequently the mutations occurred. But remember, for long-term divergence times estimates between humans and chimps, you have to use the phylogenetic replacement rate, not the mutation rate. It works like this. The mutation rate is how often there is a mutation in each instance of DNA replication. But of those mutations, many will be in somatic cells, and so those mutations can't be passed on to the offspring. Then, when it actually comes to the offspring, some mutations may cause the offspring to be non-viable, so those mutations are weeded out. Further, some offspring will likely fail to reproduce, weeding out mutations that they had. So in the long run, the phylogenetic replacement rate, which is how long a new genetic variant takes to reach 100% of a population, is always much slower than the mutation rate, and ultimately the two things do not have to be closely related. And they expected, based upon what they thought of branching from apes to human, they thought, well, there should be one mutation every six to 12,000 years, or one mutation in every 300 to 600 generations. What they observed was one in every 33 generations, they're getting these mitochondrial DNA mutations. What does that mean? It means that finally I have something I can look at as a citation. Calibrating the Mitochondrial Clock by Anne Gibbons. I'm not sure, but I don't think she's related to Gutsick Gibbon. And of course, it's from 1997. Why bother with up-to-date research here in the year of our lore 2022? Basically, the four-page article looks into some cases of observed mutations in mitochondrial DNA and notes that they seem relatively common when compared to rates measured between distantly related populations with historically known divergence times. Specifically, the paper mentions the inhabitants of Tristan da Cunha, famously the most isolated island on Earth. Also, they've got surprisingly mild weather there, basically never dipping below freezing or getting much past 70 Fahrenheit or 21 Celsius. But also, we have other areas settled within historical times for the first time, such as the Seychelles, and to some extent, Madagascar. And what do you know? While this might have been a puzzle a quarter century ago, we have figured out that the phylogenetic replacement rate and mutation rates aren't the same thing. That's why, as the paper itself notes, the long-term rates observed in populations like that of Tristan da Cunha are more in line with what we had been expecting. One of these days, Dan might be able to cite a source that's both current and supports his contention. Of course, he probably won't do that anytime soon. One last thing before we move on. Notice that he's using a quotation marks in the slide that's up. That's from page 4, and the very next sentence is, No one thinks that's the case, but at what point should models switch from one mtDNA time zone to the other? The paper is noting that we need to be careful about extrapolating mutation rates too far into the past because something is off when we try to check that against known populations. This is a blatant quote mine, and I don't appreciate it, nor I suspect would Ann Gibbons. Here's how one science writer interpreted it. She says evolutionists are most concerned about the effect of this faster, and I'll insert their observed mutation rate, not a theoretical one, but an observed one. For example, researchers have calculated that mitochondrial Eve the woman whose mitochondrial DNA was ancestral to that in all living people lived 100,000 to 200,000 years ago. That's based on what they were thinking. But using this new clock from the observed data, mitochondrial Eve would be 6,000 years old. We've already covered most of this, but even in this article, I hesitated to call it a paper as it's not formatted like one, nor do I think it is presenting itself as one, but I digress. 
In the article itself, the author notes that we have also measured the actual genetic distance between populations with long periods of isolation starting in historical times. And when we do that, we get a lower rate. That's not unmeasured. And when the question comes up of were you there, the answer is no, but historians were, and records were kept, so someone was, and they reported back. The phylogenetic replacement rate of mitochondrial DNA is just as measured as its mutation rate. And pointing out that 25 years ago, there was some question about how these relate means literally nothing for modern population genetics of humans or in general. Well, where have we seen that number before? Very, very uh, interesting, and that was a huge study. So we've all heard that the idea that we evolved from, uh, from chimps. Nope, humans did not evolve from chimps. Chimps are no more ancestral to humans than your third cousin is ancestral to you. Chimps and humans have a common ancestor that was neither a chimpanzee nor human. And that we're 98% the same. You all heard that before? Oh, the, the myth says we're 99, our DNA is 99% the same as chimps. Do you know that if you were to, to go ask DNA specialists now in every college around America that knows these studies, they would admit it's completely wrong. Uh, no. <laughs> in fact, that is still essentially the universal consensus. The only person who seems to disagree is Jeffrey Tompkins, a young earth creationist who publishes in the Answers Research Journal, which I'll remind everyone has a guide for contributors with this in it. Answers Research Journal provides scientists and students the results of cutting-edge research that demonstrates the validity of the young earth model, the global flood, the non-evolutionary origin of created kinds, and other evidences that are consistent with the biblical account of origins. This so-called journal is openly admitting that it has a prior conclusion, and if your research can't be used to support it, they will, for that reason, refuse to publish it, even if it is not actually flawed work. Oh, and if you're a longtime viewer of my channel, you might remember Andrew Snelling, perhaps the most blatantly dishonest creationist PhD I'm aware of. He's the chief editor for the Answers Research Journal. So that's the kind of scientific rigor and intellectual honesty we're dealing with. Namely, none. What they did to come up with that 99% estimate when you, you hear the elevator quip that says, oh yeah, well humans and chimps share 99% of their DNA. When they came up with that number, they ignored and discarded one quarter of our genome at 18% of the chimp genome. They took the 3 billion base pairs of the human genome and about the 3.1 billion, because chimps actually have about 5% more genetic information than humans do, and then they compared, they cut out all the strips that weren't overlapping and left only with the ones that were. Okay, so by quote-unquote overlapping, Dan means alignable. That means that some parts of either genome are hard to compare because no part of the other genome has a nucleotide sequence that is similar to the point that you can say it's homologous in the opposite genome. Why would organisms with common ancestry have such regions? Well, there are a lot of ways for extra DNA to get inserted into the genome in one lineage and not the other, such as new endogenous retroviruses, transposons going into regions in one lineage and not the other, large duplication events followed by point mutations, etc. But even when the whole genome is compared, the similarity drops to 96%, which is still greater than the similarity between any two members of family Felidae, that is, the cats, which creationists typically consider a single kind. So by the time you start removing all of the dissimilar clips from our DNA and chimps, you're left with only about 84, 85% similar. Nope, not even a little bit. This number in the mid 80s comes from Jeffrey Tompkins, whom I've already mentioned. Let's tell the tale of his attempts to do genome comparisons. First of all, when he did it the first time, he used a program called BLAST that is designed to compare genomes, which is fair enough, but it had a bug in that it treated a deletion or insertion in any aligned sequence not as a single mutation, which is what it should do, but every nucleotide after that is read as a variation until the sequences match back up perfectly, if they ever do. This would be like if I took one letter out of Genesis, then added an extra letter towards the end of Psalms, and declared that my Bible with these two errors was only about 50% similar to the Bible I started with. This is patent nonsense. But then after this, Tompkins tried again, but this time, rather than a buggy program, he just failed at high school level math. Let's give an example. Suppose you wanted to average out your walking speed. So one day you walked 1.3 kilometers and it took you 23 minutes and 20 seconds, or 1400 seconds. The next day, you walked only 500 meters and it only took you 3 minutes, because you were walking very fast. So the first day, you walked about 0.9 meters per second. The second day, you walked at 2.8 meters per second. So, is your average speed 1.85 meters per second? 
That's what you get if you just average out those two speeds you got, but that's not quite right though. In those two days, you walked 1.8 kilometers, and it took you 26 minutes and 20 seconds to do that. Really, you should divide the total distance by the total time. So that's 1,800 meters divided by 1,580 seconds. Your actual average walking speed was 1.14 meters per second. Now, I'm going to be honest, this example is heavily inspired by Ruhif, an Aussie who was fact-checking Tompkins before I was ever around. His video is linked in the description, and assuming I don't suck at YouTube, it should also be in a card at the top right of this video. You see, what Tompkins did was simply take the percent similarity of all alignable regions and then gave the simple arithmetic mean of all those outcomes. However, when you do it not like an idiot and actually weight the segments based on their total length, you arrive at the commonly accepted number of about 98% similarity. And of course, this correction has been metaphorically sitting on the desk of Andrew Snelling, but for some reason, he just won't publish a critique or retraction regarding the work of Tompkins. It's almost like the Answers Research Journal will publish any trash that sounds fancy and supports their a priori conclusions, but won't bother to fix their mistakes if it makes their conclusions seem less likely to be true. Weird, because that's not normally how peer review works. But we're also similar with a ton of other mammals, because God's using DNA to build gene instructions to make mammal types of creatures, just like, like, like humans are. Funny how when it comes to mitochondrial DNA, Dan here is all about it being inherited and being able to actually measure mutations and using mutations to attempt to date diversion times from the most recent common female line ancestor of all humans, but then we get to whole genomes and a wider set of organisms, and hold up there, Sonny. What if instead of DNA being inherited, it was just magic? That's a lot simpler, don't you think? And it also saves you from having to ask hard questions about human origins, or the origin of biodiversity in general. Suddenly, the thing literally inherited through sperm and egg is just meaningless to questions of ancestry. Sorry, bucko. But that's not how science works. That's how special pleading works. So the 99% myth has been debunked. Tell, tell, ask someone when they say, oh, haven't you heard we're 99% the same as chimps? Say, well, you know, when they came up with that, they discarded a quarter of our genome and 18% of the chimps. Sure, as long as you follow it up with the fact that when you don't do that, the similarity only drops to 96%, which, you know, is still pretty damn high. If you had a 96% chance of winning a bet, I am confident most people would take that bet. Unless, you know, they have ethical or religious objections to betting as a concept. Now, after this, Dan is going to move into blood coagulation, so this is where I'm going to call it. Thank you so much for watching this video. Do remember to hit like if you liked it. Make sure you subscribe if you're not already subscribed, and hit that bell icon so you're always notified when there's new Dapper Dino content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. I just want to take a moment to thank my channel members and my patrons on Patreon. They really help keep the lights on here. And I want to thank those pledging $20 or above, especially Bob Knob, Benthovend, Ian Chen, Chris Love, Sphinter of Doom, The Venerable Bead, and Patrick Dennis. Without the support of those whose names you see on screen right now, the channel simply wouldn't exist as it does now, and I certainly wouldn't be able to do two to three videos a week for over a year and a half now. If you would like to help support and make it so that this channel is something that can keep going, there is a link to join below the video, as well as a link to the Patreon in the channel description. If pledging money isn't right for you, please just hit like on this video, subscribe to the channel, and share my videos. That really helps my channel grow.